Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Frank on the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And tonight, in our continuing series of Medal of Honor winners, we're going to talk about Second Lieutenant John McGinty III, who died recently at the age of 73. Second Lieutenant McGinty was a Marine, and he won his Medal of Honor in 1968 for his service in Vietnam in 1966. He was part of an operation known as Operation Hastings in 1966 in Quan Tri Province. Both the date and the place were important in history because in 1965 and 66, the fight in Vietnam was shifting from a battle against the South Vietnamese Communists, the Viet Cong, to a fight against the North Vietnamese Regular Army that was infiltrating from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. The North Vietnamese Army was better trained, better supplied, more disciplined, and far more numerous than the Viet Cong. And we talked about some of that when we did a recent program on Ban Nguyen Giap. Quang Cri Province was one of the northern provinces of South Vietnam. It was right up against the North Vietnamese border, and consequently, much of the North Vietnamese regular army infiltration was through Quang Cri Province. Operation Hastings was meant to stop North Vietnamese infiltration into South Vietnam, and that's where, in July of 1966, 2nd Lieutenant McGinty saw the action that led to his Medal of Honor. Here he talks about his service and his action in Operation Hastings in 1966 in Quang Cree Province. I was born in Boston, uh, raised in Connecticut. Family went to Kentucky for my teenage years. I went to school in Kentucky and enlisted in the Marine Corps from Kentucky. I went to Paris Island and my drill instructor was an infantry uh, type. In the Marine Corps we call them O3s for the, the designator 0311. And he said, you know, nobody's a real Marine unless they're an 03. So when we went in for the interviews, in those days they didn't have uh, computers, you know, they had people interviewed you. And the lady said, well, all the tests say you should be in the clerical field. And I said, well, I don't want to be in the clerical field. If I'm not going to be in the 03 field, I don't want to be in, o, you know, in the Marine Corps at all. So she reluctantly, I guess, put me down to be an 03, and I... Uh, Walked outside to the platoon formation. The drill instructor said, what would you get? And I said, oh, three. He said, you dumbass. <laughs> John McGinty joined the Marine Corps in 1957, right after high school. Nine years later, in the summer of 66, he was a staff sergeant with the 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines in Vietnam. On July 15th, their battalion was sent into an area along the demilitarized zone. They were investigating reconnaissance reports indicating enemy activity in the vicinity. It was a battalion-sized operation. We'd gone in to find uh, what intelligence said was about a battalion of uh, VC, Viet Cong. Uh, it turned out not to be Viet Cong. It turned out to be the North Vietnamese Army. We had taken a small hill and had a hospital on it. And we stayed there for three nights on that hill. And we were attacked every night, a uh, heavy attack to just our company. There were three other companies back down the river. So my company commander, Bob Mojieski, took pity on me since I had taken a few casualties going up the first hill, made me uh, the rear security for the battalion. We were the last company and I was the last platoon. And my job was to blow up three helicopters that had been shot down in the landing zone. You know, we thought it was going to be a pretty easy uh, deal. We'd wait for the engineers, we'd blow up the helicopters, and we'd leave. We had been resupplied with ammunition the day before, and they just piled it in on us. And the other two platoons had taken off in front of me, and they left a lot of ammunition there. But being Mr. Drill Instructor, I went around and made them pick up all the ammo because I wasn't leaving it for the North Vietnamese. And everybody bitched at me all the way back to the... Uh, LZ, you know, about having to carry this, and I promised them, I said, when we go back there, uh, I'll make those platoon leaders take this ammo. Well, when I got there, there was no platoon leaders, and we had a lot of ammunition. If we hadn't had all that ammunition, I don't know whether we'd have made it or not. We were assaulted by, I think, about a regiment plus of North Vietnamese troops who uh, got online in front of us about 400 yards away, dressed to the right, and blew bugles and waved flags and whistled and charged at us, and I thought I was in a John Wayne movie or something. It was almost Civil War stuff. I turned to the radio operator before he was wounded, and I said, gee, come here, look at this. Looks like a, looks like a real war movie. And he went, oh, you crazy thing, you. But uh, it did. It was amazing to me. And 
uh, and they never stopped. They they made three assaults. Uh, the platoon, I had 32 men because we'd taken some casualties earlier. No place to go and no place to hide, so we just took the assaults. We broke the first wave. And I think we broke the second wave up pretty well. And, you know, when I talk about, you know, they all didn't fall down and die. They stopped and they shot at us. As the battle raged on, two of the squads were cut off from the rest of the platoon. McGinty charged through intense enemy machine gun and mortar fire to their position. Finding 20 men wounded and the medic dead, he quickly reloaded weapons for those who couldn't and directed their fire upon the enemy. Although he was painfully wounded as he moved to care for the disabled men, he was able to kill five enemy soldiers at point-blank range when they tried to outflank his position. I got a call over the radio by a colonel who was in a helicopter above us. He said, do you need any air support? <laughs> oh, did we need air support? So I relayed through this colonel, who I never found out his name, and if he ever sees this thing, I hope he gets a hold of me, because he's one of the guys that saved our lives. And he read off the ordinance that the aircraft had, and uh, asked me what I wanted first, and I asked for napalm. With all my troops say, thank God for napalm. That's one of the mantras. But the uh, Navy and Marine pilots put those things right on the button, and uh, we were able to hold off uh, these folks. Bob Mojieski and myself, uh, he, he was my company commander. We were the first two Marines to get it together since the Korean War. And of course, we went to the White House, and uh, I think it was in the blue room, I'm standing at attention, and the, the president makes some remarks, which I can't remember. And he came over, and the Secretary of the Navy hands him the, the medal, and he puts it around my neck. And he says, in that Texas accent, and uh, I said, yes, Mr. President, yes, Mr. President, but I don't understand a word you said. Then he went over and he put it on uh, Captain Mojieski, or Major then, Mojieski. Well, after the ceremony, I asked uh, Bob, I said, what the hell did the president say? And he turned to me and said, <laughs> and a guy who heard that said, you guys are really rubes. He was only mouthing for the camera. Well, isn't that nice? <laughs> I don't think I'm a hero. I thought a hero was somebody who saved lives. We killed him. Uh, we do what we're supposed to do. I'm, I'm uh, proud of the platoon. We all thought we were going to die that day, uh, for sure. And all of my uh, the folks that were in the platoon, if you talk to them, they uh, thought that was Judgment Day that day. Uh, but they hung in there and uh, took it and uh, ate their pain and their wounds and uh, shot North Vietnamese. If it were me alone, I probably wouldn't give a damn. Uh, but I wear this thing for uh, that platoon. Here is the Medal of Honor website citation for Staff Sergeant McGinty. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, 2nd Lieutenant McGinty's platoon, which was providing rear security to protect the withdrawal of the battalion from a position which had been under attack for three days, came under heavy small arms, automatic weapons, and mortar fire from an estimated enemy regiment. With each successive human wave which assaulted his 32-man platoon during the four-hour battle, 2nd Lieutenant McGinty rallied his men to beat off the enemy. In one bitter assault, two of the squads became separated from the remainder of the platoon. With complete disregard for his safety, 2nd Lieutenant McGinty charged through intense automatic weapons and mortar fire to their position. Finding 20 men wounded and the medical corpsman killed, he quickly reloaded ammunition magazines and weapons for the wounded men and directed their fire upon the enemy. Although he was painfully wounded as he moved to care for the disabled men, he continued to shout encouragement to his troops and to direct their fire so effectively that the attacking hordes were beaten off. When the enemy tried to outflank his position, he killed five of them at point-blank range with his pistol. When they again seemed on the verge of overrunning the small force, he skillfully adjusted artillery and airstrikes within 50 yards of his position. This destructive firepower routed the enemy who left an estimated 500 bodies on the battlefield. Second Lieutenant McGinty's 
personal heroism, indomitable leadership, selfless devotion to duty, and bold fighting spirit inspired his men to resist the repeated attacks by a fanatical enemy, reflected great credit upon himself, and upheld the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the U.S. Naval Service. There are a couple of ironies about 2nd Lieutenant McGinty's medal. He was awarded by President Lyndon Johnson in March of 1968. Major Modrieski also was awarded his Medal of Honor at the White House at that ceremony. Less than a month later, President Johnson, under siege from anti-war opposition, announced he would not run for another term as president in 1968. With America's sons in the fields far away, with America's future under challenge right here at home, with our hopes and the world's hopes for peace and the balance every day, I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes or to any duties other than the awesome duties of this office, the presidency of your country. Accordingly, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Well, for all intents and purposes, that was the beginning of the end of American involvement in the Vietnam War. Meanwhile, in 1984, after becoming a devout Christian, 2nd Lieutenant McGinty became one of the few Americans to renounce his Medal of Honor, and he did so for religious reasons, even though he continued to attend military reunions organized by the Medal of Honor Society. He always retained that immense respect for his platoon that he talked about earlier in the segment. 2nd Lieutenant McGinty was a brave man and a true hero. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tapps. Since 2nd Lieutenant McGinty was a Marine, we're going to close tonight with a little bit of the Marine hymn. And let me say, as I say for all our Medal of Honor winners, 2nd Lieutenant McGinty, thank you, and we owe you a debt that we can never, ever possibly repay. Semper Fi. Mm-hmm.